Chapter 17 Land of the Phoenicians It is firmly believed by the people of the Lebanon that Noah, leaving the ark resting upon the towering heights of Ararat to the north, brought his folk and their animals to dwell in this lovely land between the mountains and the eastern Mediterranean. Here, too, came the Phoenicians in one of those mass migrations not unusual in the east. Leaving their South Arabian homeland, they trekked to the Levant, making a new home among the glorious cedars and snow-capped mountains. The Lebanese Republic today is the result of a succession of historical events such as must be paralleled in few other lands. As the modern magic carpet glided over Beirut harbour, the sheer magic of the deep green sea, the gently sloping uplands, the fairy whiteness of the buildings all combined to create such an impression of sheer delight as I have never seen elsewhere. After sun-baked Omdurman, it beckoned, doubly fascinating. This, then, was one reason for the country having been a coveted prize of Greeks, Romans, Byzantines and Turks. From here, the Phoenician merchant lords directed their trading ships to Africa, Egypt and even far-off Britain. And today it is here that students of 60 nationalities come to study at the American University, in search of that knowledge whose tradition in the Lebanon has been unbroken for several thousand years. Christianity came early to the Lebanon. Today, with a Christian majority population, Lebanon is the only Arab land where the Prime Minister is, by tradition, of the Christian faith. On the wide, rolling plains stretching through Tyre and Sidon, southwards to Palestine, nomads graze their sheep and live the placid life of a people secure in their faith, organised into clans by that patriarchal system which is unchanged since biblical times. Yet modern progress has come, and unashamedly, here you will find no grudging retreat before the advance of Western inventions. Rather, do the modern Lebanese, like the Phoenicians themselves, take pride in exploiting every means to make life more fruitful, more in line with a people clearly dedicated to peace. I doubt whether there are many places as cosmopolitan as, for example, Beirut. Like most other Arab towns on the world's new highways of the air, the city teems with a variegated life, with colour, bustle, men and women of a score or more of nations. In one respect, though, the city has a life all its own, whereas in Cairo, or Athens, or even Istanbul, one sees this kaleidoscope of nations as simply wayfarers, these many strange and intent figures of Beirut are native Lebanese. Some from the mountains, dressed in fur-lined boots and woolen cloaks, come from the redoubtable tribes of the Druze. Theirs is a heritage of war, of ceaseless guerrilla operations against the French, whose mandate expired after the Second World War, when Lebanon regained her independence. The tall, fair-skinned, athletic men in black and white turbans are the Kurds, whose origins have been traced on the wall tablets of Assyria and who once ruled from Turkey to the Persian Gulf. Their pretender king now lives quietly in London, and Kurdistan remains split up between Iraq, Syria and Lebanon, Turkey and Persia. The main body of the people, of course, speak Arabic and dress in the Arab manner. They have their sheikhs and nobles, their black tents and herds of camels, true, Yet, in spite of this, their very differences from the peninsula Arab again brings to mind the question of what is an Arab, and the only answer is that given me by a Bedouin sheikh in Lebanon. An Arab, he said, gazing at me with clear blue eyes, his massive athletic flame contrasting greatly with that of my Saudi Arab companions, is a man, no matter his religion or appearance, who feels that he is an Arab, nothing more. As I sat in a cafe, watching the endless passing and repassing of these exotic figures against the background of an ultra-modern city, I could not but wonder how it was that such a people, of three races and at least two religions, could combine in such harmony, working and living together, 
how did they feel themselves to be a nation? If this seeming miracle could be accomplished here, was there some lesson that I could learn that might provide the key to half the world's minority problems, to the unending struggle of Arab against Jew, of Muslim against Hindu, of nation against nation, that seems endemic to the present time? I found, I believe, at least part of the answer in the famed American University of Beirut. When it was founded, as the Protestant College some ninety years ago, its first president, Dr. Bliss, laid down the principles which not only enabled this Christian organization to maintain its existence in the then Muslim Turkish Empire, but which has ever since provided the solvent of harmony in an Arab world of growing nationalistic exclusiveness. The college decided at once that it must concentrate upon the common ground between people and peoples. It also resolved to ignore the differences in opinion held by the students. As Daniel Bliss said, This college is for all conditions and classes of men without regard to colour, nationality, race or religion. A man black, white or yellow, Christian, Jew, Mohammedan or heathen, may enter and enjoy all the advantages of this institution for three, four or eight years and go out believing in one God or many gods or no God at all. At the same time, the sincerely convinced Christians who founded the university were not prepared to yield on their own beliefs. But it will be impossible for anyone to continue with us for long without knowing what we believe to be the truth and our reasons for that belief. Nine decades have passed since the foundation of this amazing institution. During that time, men and women of almost every nationality have graduated here. Some of the past and present leaders of the Arab and Eastern world received their education at the AUB, as it is called. As I ascended the incline through the pines and cedars to the fifty buildings which now house the university, these thoughts were in my mind. Formerly just outside Beirut, the town has so encroached during recent years that the university, with its dominant position overlooking Beirut's enchanting bay, is almost a dominating feature of the skyline. The other outstanding landmark is a colossal statue of the Virgin Mary, patron saint of the Lebanon, which rears high above the city. At night, when the crown of this immense symbol is illuminated, its effect is striking indeed. Through the seventy acres of semi-tropical plants which comprise the college grounds I went, below spread out map-like before the Mediterranean foam are the terraced slopes of gardens, running down to the vivid green of playing fields, and then the university's own swimming beach. Beirut claims that there is no other educational institution in the world in such an idyllic setting. I saw, chatting between lectures in the brilliant Beirut sun, students from 21 religious groups. Over 40 nationalities are represented among the 2,700 students here. The university is co-educational, and women as well as men travel great distances to earn the undoubted cachet of a Beirut degree. Nowadays, with the expanding East greatly in need of trained scientists, Beirut is one of the universities where the highest priority is being given to medicine, engineering and social studies. My visit to the American University was what the Americans would call a high spot in my exploration of truly fascinating Lebanon. And yet, though it may be but a personal view, there seemed equal exhilaration in wandering, for a time, among the people of the countryside talking with Bedouins and traders, shepherds and soldiers, housewives and children. This, to me, seemed the most rewarding. Our delight in conversation seemed mutual, though all too often I found people of the humbler kind rather too inclined to seek my views as a traveller and not to give their own. This politeness is something characteristic of the Lebanese and probably a result of the high tradition of ancient culture which is theirs. Earthquakes and conquest, the Crusades and the Turkish invasion have sadly depleted the country of its most ancient monuments. 
Few traces, for example, still exist of the great merchant king Hiram, king of Tyre, who was Solomon's partner in commercial enterprises. Today Tyre as a town is nothing remarkable, yet I could not but gaze upon it with something approaching homage. It was from here that the huge merchant fleets of Phoenicia sped forth to Egypt with timber, to Cornwall for tin, to establish glorious Carthage, and to Spain, Sardinia, and a dozen other places. 2,500 years have passed since that day, and though a traveller is, in the words of the greatest of all Arab travellers, Ibn Battuta, a traveller because he is imaginative, I stood there, near the ruined crusader castles, watching herdsmen bringing home their sheep, and thinking of some of man's greatest dramas enacted on this stamping ground of the Assyrian and Babylonian hosts. Journeying northwards, again alongside the seaside strip, I sought out the once-famed Isle of Ruat, now little known except by its local inhabitants. Associated with Alexander the Great, it lies a few miles off the coast, and is one of the very few truly Phoenician cities to survive. Indeed, under the Phoenicians, the island, named then Arvad, as the capital of the kingdom of the same name, extended its sway far into the interior of the mainland. Bleak and forbidding even in the mellow afternoon light, it is reached by Arab sailing boats, operated by sailors whose politeness is too great to ask the stranger's unaccountable reason for coming here. The men of Phoenicia had brought from somewhere, with a doggedness not unusual among the ancients, vast monolithic slabs with which to girdle the island's fortress. Many of these still stand, rising to fifty feet or more above the sea. Upon them was built a crusader castle, which remained an unconquered outpost for a decade after the whole coast came under Saracen rule. Sallying forth from this impregnable stronghold, the Phoenicians founded a strange and nowadays almost eerie temple at Amrit, a little to the south on the mainland. Here rises the immense bulk of the Snail Tower, a huge black cube which represented the ancient Semitic goddess Astarte, later to be known as Aphrodite, and the Venus of the Romans. No trace now remains of the vast city which is said to have surrounded this strange sanctuary. In the gathering twilight, only the bare blackness of the cube dominates an uninviting landscape, where once great religious rites and processions must have taken place to honour the patroness of Phoenician might. Impressive though they are, these and other ruins are distinctly alien to Lebanese life today. In Egypt, for example, when I visited the Great Pyramid in the Valley of the Kings, Local inhabitants showed in their pharaonic ancestors a pride that is reflected even in modern Cairo by a fumbling resurgence of that ancient architecture. The Lebanese seem to feel no such sensation. Neither are they, in a deep sense, somehow of the West. Yet both the modern West and the oldest of the Eastern Mediterranean civilizations meet here. Enigmatically, perhaps, the people of modern Phoenicia seem determined to claim something different. Their outlook on life, if I have judged it aright, tends to be focused upon cultural and spiritual progress. When I remarked on this to a very analytically-minded French professor who had spent most of his life in the Levant, he held that the Lebanese mind, like that of neighbouring Syria, was rooted in the wholly unique influence of the Holy Land. The pastoral and Bedouin character of the people, he felt, still holds those values which were esteemed by the visionaries of the Old Testament tribes. This may very well be true, for it is clearly not a racial attitude alone. The desert nomad of Arabia thinks very much in the same way as his fellow of Lebanon, even though they are of very distinctly different stock. I found the Lebanese delightful people, but decided it was time to head for Jordan and Jerusalem.